Good morning. Last week was difficult. Um, it was a difficult message to bring forth. This week and next week, um, I suspect, are going to be no uh, less difficult. But the subject matter, it is what it is. And uh, a long time ago, I determined uh, when we started this church that you know I wasn't going to pull sermons out of the headlines but that I thought, you know, if we just study a book of the Bible, then uh, there are subject matters that I may not want to discuss, but here they are, and I'm forced then. It's, it was a check on me. Um, and then we could discuss the things that so few ch churches are willing to discuss. Unfortunately, that's it. Yeah, we're going to deal with gap theories and sons of gods and things like that, and it's going to be fun, and everyone's going to go, oh, that's really interesting. And and then we're going to have messages like today. And people are going to be like, maybe you should do topicals more often. That's just, that's, you know, it is. So, uh, yeah, we'll do topicals every once in a while, but we're in 1 Corinthians, and we're in the fifth chapter. Now, before we get started, what we're going to do is I'm going to intro this in, in a unique way. We're going to intro it in. This is the plan. Half of today's message, introduction, second half of the message, pour the foundation. Lord willing, next week we'll build thereupon. Okay? So we're actually only going to get through one verse out of 1 Corinthians chapter 5 today. We will look at more verses, but that's the only verse that we're going to dig into this morning. Before we get started, I would very much like to point out... Um, the number of verses that you find in this particular chapter. Someone go ahead and shout it out when you take a look at it. How many, how many verses in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 5? 13. Now, I don't buy into the number 13 in a superstitious fashion. Um, I, I do not avoid the number as if it's got some sort of hocus pocus attached to it. If a, 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 a a high-rise building has 13 floors. I, I will ride the elevator to the 13th floor. It doesn't scare me. Right? Um, but that said, I, I do believe it is very symbolic in scriptures. That number stands for sin, Satan, and rebellion. And it's all over the scripture. This, this entire chapter, it's a short one really, in comparison to the other ones, and it ends at 13. And it's dedicated to dealing with somebody in the local assembly who has, uh, is given himself over to willful rebellion against God. And there are 13 verses. You say, well, it's coincidence. Okay. In John chapter 13, we read of Judas Iscariot uh, rebelling against the Lord Jesus Christ, Judas Iscariot, 13 letters. Um, and he is, his name means uh, Jewish man from Kiriath. Judah Iscariot, Judas, Judah, man from Kiriath. Now, that's Moab. The, and the scripture says an awful lot about Moab. And there's a connection to Antichrist there. In Revelation chapter 13, we read that the beast rises up to take dominion over the world that really would rather have him than Jesus Christ. Yeah. So, you can say, well, that, again, that's coincidence. Okay. Um, can I show you really quick? Go to Revelation. Keep, I, I guess we'll start here. Let's go to Revelation. So let's look at a couple of these just really quick. Because it's very easy to say, well, that's a coincidence. It doesn't take any discipline. It doesn't take any heart contemplation to see and to think about whether or not God might be doing something very specific. Right? Isn't it easy to just go, ah. 
But if he's actually doing things with numbers in the scripture, well, then that's got to mean something. All right? Now, in Revelation 13, look at verse 18, the end of the chapter. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast. For it is the number of a man. The number of man in Scripture is six. Okay? It is the number of a man, six. And his, his number, this man's number, is 600, three score, and six. Anyone know what a score is? You've got to go back to the Gettysburg Address and all that other stuff. Right? It's 20. Three score is what? 60. All right, we're good. So it's 666. That's the number of the beast. Why? Well, what's the triune number? The triune God is three. Well, this is man elevating himself to the place of God. That's what this is. That's why, his, that's why the beast number is that. By the way, that's, Re that's Revelation 13. What's the verse number? What's the verse number that I just read to you? 18. Yeah, 6 plus 6 plus 6 is 18. Oh, coincidence. All right, okay, good. I'll just keep that coincidence argument in your mind, all right? And in 2 Chronicles 9.13, 13, 13, we read of Solomon multiplying gold unto himself which was contrary to the law because the king, according to Scripture, was not, he was not supposed to multiply horses or gold unto himself. And he did in one particular year, and in the 13th verse of chapter 9, it tells you how many talents of gold he acquired. Does anyone see it there? How many talents of gold did he, require, did he acquire? 666 talents of gold. Again, a 666 and 13, Satan, Antichrist, rebellion, all flowing together. Do we see it? Are we, are we at the place of saying maybe there's something here? Okay, well I'm just reading along. This was about seven or eight days ago. There's a couple of you that are in my reading plan as well. And I didn't happen to go hunting for this, but in Luke chapter 10, Luke 10. Let's start in verse 17, because you're going to see that this verse this is so out of place. Jesus' comment is so out of place. And 70 returned, again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. And he said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Okay, thank you, Lord. I mean, I know they're talking about the subject matter of devils, but Jesus just goes all the way back to millennia in the past and says, you know, I was there when Satan fell. I watched it. Now, how many words are in that verse? Someone count them up. Thirteen. Thirteen. If you've got the right book in verse 18, not verse 17, in verse 18, you've got 13 letters. Again, in verse 18, six plus six plus six. I beheld Satan as, as lightning fall from heaven. There's a connection here, folks. There is a, now, this is the good stuff because there are many, many, many more verses like this. Not all of them. So now everyone's going to be looking at every 13 and 18 in the scripture. And that's fine. Look. Look. You'll see lots of them. Some you'll be like, oh, there's nothing here. Right. It's not every verse 8, 13 or chapter 13 or every verse 18. It's not all of them. But I want to bring this up too because so here we're dealing with this. Today's message is called Leaven Part 1. Okay. Next week it'll be Leaven Part 2. Okay. In between that, now it was Joe was supposed to give me a reprieve, but he's got to work this week. So the message that I had prepared for the end, uh, uh, or for two Wednesdays from now, will now be this Wednesday. And it has to do with leaven in a doctrinal sense. 
So it's all going to work together. Now, here's the funny thing. For those who like to say, well, I don't believe that the King James Bible can be inspired. I wouldn't believe in any inspiration of a translation. I only believe in the original autographs. There were no verse markings in the originals. So what do you do now? Because I just showed you some things that if you want to deny it, go ahead. But you got these verse markings in a King James Bible. I believe, and I've said this for many, many years, that the King James Bible, the translators, were inspired by God to take the Hebrew and the Greek and to translate it into one language that the whole world would speak. So, well, uh, yeah, but it doesn't match up with modern English. Can we help that man has denigrated and degenerated the English language into what it is? God said this would be the last language of the world. And so here's my word combined, the Hebrew portion and the Koine Greek, which, by the way, was also what of the world? The language of the world in Jesus' day. Put all together and said, there's one last language. Here it is. And it'll be like a, the Antichrist will speak with the mouth of a lion. Lion being the, the likeness of England. Speaks with English. You know, the lion, the coat of arms, all that stuff. And I say, well, there's a lot there. There is a lot there. But I just want to let you know that this is what I believe. Okay? I believe my King James Bible is absolutely 100% inspired, not just preserved, but inspired. That's right. And if the verse markings alone, if I couldn't just show in that, didn't at least make you think, then I got nothing. I can't help you. I can't help. Then it's just willful. That's just willful. Today, we are dealing with, if you want to go back, to Corinthians, you can, I think, or I'm probably going to have you elsewhere. Actually, why don't you go to Deuteronomy? But for today, we're going to deal with a man in open, willful rebellion against God that isn't Satan and that isn't the beast. But he's a saved man in a local assembly. Oh, and I, can I add this as well? Now, this is probably just coincidence, because I, cer I promise you I didn't plan for it. This is our 13th message out of the series of 1 Corinthians. You do with it what you will. Granted, we will go into 14 with the message, but I'm just saying, I just thought, this is the 13th message, so this is pretty cool. Um, today's subject matter you can read 1 Corinthians chapter 5. It's easy to understand. Very easy to understand. But the material is so weighty because it goes beyond good doctrine into the realm of sound doctrine, which is living, which is lifestyle. And... Um, I promise you this as well. This type of a message is ignored by nearly every church in America that names the name of Christ. That's right. See, well, there you go again, seeing how you know, Bible believers is better. I'm not saying Bible believers is better. I'm just saying we have a different approach. Okay? We're, hopefully, I'm not afraid to deal with the subject matters that must needs be dealt with. And this is one of them. And... And, and the world, or I should say the churches out there that are worldly and carnal, they don't want to deal with the subject matter because it is hurtful and mean-spirited and judgmental. Those, by the way, are the three cardinal sins of the Laodicean church age. It's true. I can do anything in a local assembly except for be mean. I can be caught in any kind of sin and still be accepted in, but if I'm mean, and what I mean by mean is quoting scripture, that is unacceptable. 
Do you guys know I'm right here? <clears throat> but whether you like it or not, and I don't always like it, whether you like it or not, how God sees it as not hurtful, mean-spirited, and judgmental, he sees it as healing and right-spirited and discerning. It'll keep a local assembly pure. Now there's a word that means nothing to us. The only time we care about pure is in our diets or in our water, because we're carnal. Other than that, who cares? We, I, I want our assembly to be as pure as it can be in this body of flesh, and it's still a body of flesh, yeah. right? But as pure as it can be, and in right standing with God, and in an understanding of what righteous judgment consists of, yeah. and not to let the world label what we do is in our preaching, which then the churches pick up on because they spend more time taking instruction from the world than they do from the Word of God, to then say likewise, this is wrong. No, no, no. We're going to stick with this. And I'm not going to let that world out there tell me what they think purity means because they don't have a clue. And I know they don't have a clue because I'm going to admit it. I don't have a clue. I'm not God. I don't see like God. I don't feel like God. I'm not holy like God. Now, that doesn't, sit, that doesn't mean that I just then brush it off and go, well, who cares? No, I care. Because if he weren't holy, he wouldn't have sent his holy son to die for me if it didn't matter about holiness. I'm glad some people are with me. You're going to need to be. <laughs> that world out there is going to tell you, don't judge me. Right? Come on. Yeah. And then judge you for judging them. Come on, think. Use your, use your brain reason here. Because if I'm going to judge the way they judge, then I'm going to turn into a hypocrite. Because they do judge. You're so judgmental. That phrase alone tells me that you have judged me as judgmental. You're hurtful. You've judged me as hurtful. You're mean-spirited. You've judged me as mean-spirited. Come on, don't let, don't let them manipulate you. Throw it right back at them. They're hypocrites, this is easy. It's like taking candy from a kid. They got no arguments. Come on. Fine, I'm a bigot. Thank you. You're judgmental. <laughs> Amen. So, we've got some stormy seas that we need to enter this morning. And so I'll ask you, congregation, and I'm just going to give you the opportunity to voice your opinion, not that I will take it, but I'm going to give you an opportunity to voice your opinion. Shall we cross these seas together, or shall we skip it so that we can feel better about ourselves? You're not going to feel good about you. You're not going to feel good about me. But I can promise you again, if I can make another promise, that if you'll enter that boat, and we enter that boat together, and we cross those tumultuous seas together, I promise you that if we're willing, Jesus will go with us. And you see, it's funny because I read in Mark chapter 4, Jesus is able to take those tumultuous seas and just speak to them and tell them to be calm. So if we'll trust him in the tumultuous waters that we're now entering, I believe that he can apply some peace to us through it all. All right. Amen. Uh, let's read the whole chapter, but we're honing in on verse 1. So there's my introduction. I told you we'd give half of the message to the introduction. Little did you know it would be about the number 13. And then let's, let's read the 13 verses, but again, it's verse 1 that we're going to hone in on. It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles, 
that one should have his father's wife. I think I speak for all of us when I say, you. And ye are puffed up and have not rather mourned that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. What does that mean, taken away? For, verily, for I verily, as absent in body, but present in spirit, have judged already. Paul, you're so mean. Have judged already as though I were present concerning him that hath so done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when ye are gathered together in my spirit with the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. See, sometimes the presence isn't always there. Sometimes a man's spirit is just there. And I'm not talking about astral projection. I'm just talking about you know where I lie with this subject matter. If you guys are ever in a Bible study and you go, well, we know what Pastor Seth believes about this subject matter. That's my spirit with you. Okay? Um, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ to deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Your glorying is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? Purge out, therefore, the old leaven, and that's why I've entitled this Leaven, Part 1, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and in truth. Now, you're going to need, to even understand those verses, you're going to have to have a little understanding of the feast days. We'll get to that. Um, I wrote unto you, verse 9, in an epistle, not to company with fornicators, yet not altogether with fornicators of this world, or with the covetous, or extortioners, or idolaters, for then must ye needs go out of the world. That verse very simply saying, no, obviously you can't, I mean, you're going to deal with these types of people. You can't disappear. You're going to deal with these people. But, verse 11, but now I have written unto you not to keep company if any man that is called a brother, a brother, what are we talking about? Save people. Be a fornicator, or covetous, or an idolater, or a railer, or a drunkard, or an extortioner, with such an one, know not to eat. Are you getting this, that he says in verse 10, you know, you, you have to work with some of these people. You're going to have luncheons with them. I go to lunch with these people at work. But a brother, I can't. That's what it says. For what, I, for what have I to do to judge them also that are without? Do not ye judge them that are within? We're going to talk about what all this means because I know there's some of it a little, little difficult. But by and large, you get this. You get the understanding here, right? Verse 13. But them that are without, God judgeth. Therefore, put away from among yourselves that wicked person. Why? So who can judge him? That's what it says. How are we feeling? Good? Stretch? Like the, you know, you do it in the junior church room. Okay, kids, stand up, stretch, right? Not that you're children, but you understand what I'm saying. Sometimes we kind of just need, we need a mental stretch. Father. Uh, well, we need help this morning, I think. Um, taking in this lesson because it's a hard one lord it's it's one that i believe is parental and this applies to the home as much as it does to the church and i believe lord god that it is doctrinal and practical and that you want to keep your church unleavened you went through all that work to purify yourself a bride and then we as the bride sometimes we put on the clothes of an harlot and uh, Lord you, you don't want that from us you want you want a chaste virgin um, as the scripture describes Lord God and I know even in our in our world Lord God that's laughed at and mocked like someone who's pure is substandard Lord but I, that's what you're looking for. 
And I don't care what that world says out there, Lord. It's, it's right to be prudent. And you want a, a church body that's prudent, like a chaste virgin. And so, Lord, we would ask that um, in our state of flesh that we might not mess that up, um, that you might help us to receive this message this morning, um, that we might do what's right by you. And help us to get it, Lord. Just be with us now. In Jesus' name, amen. Verse 1 says, It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles, that one should have his father's wife. Okay, so we've got to start with this phrase, it is commonly reported, because this is important. And the reason that I say that is because, listen, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Amen. Romans 3.23. That's you, that's me. All of us. There is not a just man upon earth that doeth good and sinneth not. Ecclesiastes 7 and verse 20. And I know all those verses, and hopefully you know those verses. There's not a person in this room, lost or saved, that has mastered control over their body of flesh to the point of never sinning. I know there's some people who think they have. And it's not a lot of fun when you meet them. Amen. But this is about a report. It's commonly what? Reported. Okay, so now we need some discretion from another area of Scripture. That's Deuteronomy 13. <laughs> oh, Lord help us. Deuteronomy 13. <laughs> uh, starting at verse 12, we're going to read down through 15. And verse 12 says, If thou shalt hear say in one of thy cities, which the Lord thy God hath given thee to dwell there, saying, Certain men, the children of Belial. What does that mean? Children of the devil, found in Deuteronomy 13, 13. And I wasn't even bringing you to this verse for that. God's book's right. Amen. Certain men, the children of Belial, are gone out from among you and have withdrawn the inhabitants of their city, saying, Let us go and serve other gods which ye have not known. Then shalt thou inquire and make search and ask diligently, and behold, if it be truth and the thing certain that such an abomination is wrought among you, thou shalt surely smite the inhabitants of that city with the edge of the sword, destroying it utterly and all that is therein and the cattle thereof, with the edge of the sword. Now, this is law for the nation of Israel, right? Never am I instructing you to go out there to someone who's worshiping falsely, take a sword and hack their head off, unless you want to take this sword, because you're a spiritual people, so you have a spiritual sword, and you are allowed to use this. Okay? See, well, that's why they don't like me. Right. Because if someone was doing what we're talking about here and they had to take a physical sword, national security and all, do you think the person to which the sword was applied was very happy with the local government? And so if you take a spiritual sword because someone's breaking spiritual law and you bring it to their attention, you hack them a little bit with that, what do you expect they're going to do? They're not going to like you. It's okay. It's all right. People are going to, not everyone's going to like you, folks. Right. If you're going to live your whole life wanting to please other people, you can't please God. Right. It will be impossible. Oh. It will be impossible. Because yeah. he's so opposite of humanity. Right. In verse 12, you should note the fourth and fifth words of the verse. They are the words hear and say. It's that from which we get the one word, hearsay. Right? I've heard of that word. What is hearsay? It's a report. 
That's what it is. That report, however, must needs be substantiated with, look at the verses, inquiry, search, and diligent asking. That is a good lesson for all of us, even for those of us who are not under the Mosaic law, if you will. It's great personal advice. If you get hearsay, uh, inquire, search, ask some people. Is this true? Is this true? Is this true? But make it sure. And if you can't, throw it out. That's what the Bible would instruct us. Before you make a judgment, get all of the facts. Amen. Make sure it's substantiated with witnesses. Now, even that is flawed. And I'm not saying that the word of God is flawed. This is one of those things where even Paul talked about that the law, it didn't meet all the needs. Not because the law is flawed, but because man is flawed. And it points it out very specifically. So while this system is great, and it's right, and it's true, it requires that everyone that is enacting it is pure and honest. For example, they found false witnesses to lie against Jesus. So the hearsay was substantiated by witnesses. They got two of them so that they could put them to death. But they were liars. So again, the system works until man destroys the system. That's why, you know, you could say what you want about capitalism versus socialism versus theocracies versus democracies versus whatever, communism. Doesn't matter. As long as man's in charge, it's going to be ruined. It's the truth. And I'm not a communist. I'm not a socialist. I'm not a capitalist either. I'm a Bible believer, so I'm not any of those ists. Amen. You're not as conservative as we thought we were. I'm more conservative than you think I am. That's why I'm not Republican. Amen. Amen. Bunch of liars, every one of them. I can trust a Democrat before I can trust a Republican. That's true. Because they tell you flat out what they believe. I know they're insane. Republicans will tell me everything I want to hear and then do the complete opposite. Amen. Amen. I wasn't planning on that. That was just actually, that was frosting on the cake for you this morning. Just, just in case I wanted to alienate you further from me, here we go. Now, this all said, back in our text, it is reported, what's the word that follows? Commonly. That means that there has been substantiation from a number of witnesses. Right? Are we in agreement? Yeah, if it's a common report, it is absolutely substantiated. This sin was known, if not well known, among the people. And let me say that this... This is not a flaw in one's character or a fault, as the scripture calls them. This is sin. There's a difference. Because all of us have faults. Let's go to James. Uh, chapter 5, verse 16. If I'm not mistaken, and I may be because I don't have one in front of me, perhaps the NIV or some of the other verses change the word here. In verse 16 it says, Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Some of the perversions say confess your sins. Um, no... I don't want to know all of your sins. You don't want to know all mine. Now, if I'm confiding in a brother over a particular sin because I want you to pray, 
okay, I, I, I get that and I'm for it. But do I believe that everyone ought to stand up here one after another and start confessing all their sins in front of everybody? Mass chaos. You know what I will say? I am a faulty man. Faults are not sins. Faults are flaws in the character. They lead to sin. You know, like a fault of mine, which I can confess, would be that I, I am um, someone who is given over to, how do I want to say this? Um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, um, I'm habitual. I have a habitual character, which works great because I habitually read the Bible. There are some good things I do habitually. But the fact that I'm habitual can also mean that I can take something bad and do that regularly. That's a fault. So I would ask and say, pray for your pastor that his habitual nature would not go in the wrong direction. Can you do that for me? Okay. And you got them too. And maybe they're not those. Maybe it's something else. But it could lead potentially to something bad. So there's the difference. Okay. That's not what we're talking about in 1 Corinthians. A fault can lead to an inward sin, iniquity. Just think of it this way. Is sin in I, in iquity, in I? Is it in me? You know, and Jesus said that, that iniquity, begin, you know, it begins in the heart. That's where murder begins. Murder begins as an, an iniquity. It begins really with malice. No, envy, then malice. And it works in that person, and it begins to fester, and that murderous thoughts and the malice I want to see someone get hurt that is an in iniquity and when it crosses the line and Cain slew his brother Abel what he did then was transgressed that's like drawing a line and stepping over the line a transgression is to go beyond something so now you're taking your iniquity and you are now doing something to somebody else. You are transgressing the law and transgressing another person. And it's one thing, you know, I mean, if I have an iniquity, I get down on my knees and I got to ask the Lord to forgive me. But if I've transgressed against you, well, now I have two responsibilities. I've got to ask the Lord for forgiveness and I really should come to you and ask you to forgive me. Now, that said, if I've not done that, and I don't even know that I've, by a fault, transgressed against you, because some of it can be ignorant, well, that's where Matthew 18 comes into play. And Matthew 18 gives very specific instructions, as in verses 15 through 17, that if I feel that you have offended me, you have transgressed against me, I am to come to you and let you know what you did. Not to go, you suck, and here's why. But to say, we're not hand in hand right now. There's something so bothering me that I don't want to talk to you, and I don't want to spend time with you, and I don't want to be around you, and I don't like you very much right now. But I know I should. So it's this issue that has caused this rift, and that's what a fault does. A fault line separates two bodies. And now that I've transgressed that fault line and I've transgressed against you and have hurt you, now we're separated. So can we, can I just point this out to you, brother, sister? This is what hurt me. Can I be honest enough with you to let you know this is what hurt me? And I'm having a hard time getting past this. And then it is the responsibility then, it all falls on the person who transgressed in the first place. They may have known it and didn't care and that's on them. Or maybe they didn't know it and now they knew, now they do and now it's on them. But it wasn't on them until they knew. 
And so now it's their responsibility to, if it's legitimate, make restoration, restitution. Okay? I went into it was all side thought, but a fault can lead to a transgression against a brother or sister, even unintentionally. Again, I want you to understand it, but that's not the case in 1 Corinthians. Not what we're talking about here. If it was about faults and not about sin, there'd be nobody in this church. Because the lesson is you've got to get rid of the person out of the church. There'd be nobody here if it was about faults. We all, we all have them. Yeah. So it's not what it's about. It's already not full. Can you imagine? There'd be cobwebs on every church door. Amen. This is about gross sin. Willful and purposefully acted out with no desire to repent. That's the context. Interesting, because in the previous chapter, Paul said, judge nothing before the time. Didn't he? Remember we talked about that? But hopefully I made it clear. Again, you can't just take a verse and run with it. It has to be in its context. And hopefully I made it clear that the context of that was about not judging the matters of the judgment seat of Christ before the time. Can't do it. Because you can't judge the heart. You don't know the heart. And the heart's a part of that issue. But the judgment that is required by a congregation to keep itself pure in the sight of God is a different matter altogether. And the particular sin here that they were dealing with at the Corinth church was one of fornication. Not a new sin. Not a new problem. Not a problem that is exclusive to those that occupy, occupy the pews or chairs. Not exclusive to those who occupy pulpits. It's found on both sides. Yeah. What is new or newer, I should say, is the desire to sweep sin under the carpet rather than deal with it in the local assemblies. Local assemblies have had sin in them from the beginning. Ananias and Sapphira, the church at Corinth, it kept going. It will be in this church. It will be in other churches. It keeps going. It just is. Because man is at his core sinful. But this idea that we shouldn't ever really deal with it, that's newer. 20th century, epidemic in 21st century. And I'll share this as an example with you. But it was commonly reported to me that a particular church um, had some trouble with their praise band. I always use the praise band in quotes. I don't know. I got a thing about praise bands. Not that they're wrong. Not that it's wrong to have a band of people get together and praise God or to have a group of musicians to get together. <laughs> There's just something about that phrase that makes my eyebrows go up. Say, what is it, preacher? I don't know. Other than the experience that I've had with praise bands not being very godly. Yeah. And so this particular one, there were a couple of members. Don't worry, it's not a Bible-believing church. Stop going through. Don't worry about it. None of that doesn't matter. And the deal was that Two people in the praise band, young kids, always, because that's what kids get drawn to is praise bands. That's another reason why I go. Why is that I can't get you to church, but I can get you to pick up a guitar? What's going on? You want to sing praise to God, but I can't you get sit down and read the Bible. Something not right. Something's not right. See, that's why I go, praise band? What do you mean praise band? What is that? Just I'm a watchdog, folks. That's just the way I operate. Now, there was fornication going on between two parties of the praise band in the church parking lot after they got through practicing their praise. 
was brought to the attention of the pastor. Congregation waited, to see what would happen next week. Next week came, and there were the two people with their instruments singing praises to God. Congregation looked around at each other. A few people got upset, only a few, because that's how it goes. And went to the pastor after and said, I don't understand. Why are they praising God right now? Why are they leading our worship? Of course, they refer to it as worship. It's not, it's praise. But let's not go off on that bunny trail. Why are you doing that? Why, why are you allowing this? His response was, and I quote, I just believe in grace. Can I say this? God doesn't just believe in grace. And he's more gracious than anyone I've ever met. But he doesn't just believe in grace. I'm wanting to share more, but I really shouldn't, so I won't. Now, this isn't just what we're dealing with here. This isn't just fornication. There was something going on in this church that wasn't even named among the lost people of the region. Like of all the crimes that were being committed out in that world, there was no report of this happening out there, but it was in here. That a man would fornicate with his father's wife. Now the assumption is that it's not also his mom, but rather a stepmom. But at this point, does it really matter? Because it's disgusting no matter what. Can I get an amen there? Amen. All right. Fornication is any form of the sexual, physical sexual relationship with another person outside God's intent for marriage. It is, there are two parts to marriage. None of them is a pastor or a priest saying you're now married. We're going to get to that. It's not a ceremony. It's an oath between two parties, and it is a physical act. Those two, for, throughout all scripture, is what marriage is. The intent to stay together forever and the physical relationship that goes along with it. So what is fornication? It's a perversion of marriage. Because it's one half of marriage without the intent of cleaving to the wife. It's wrong. It's sin. And it's gross. And God says, when you do that, you sin against your own soul. That's scripture. Okay? This case was worse in that it also included adultery. Because it was another man's wife. So this brilliant young man, I'm going to assume he's young, because only someone so stupid would be, you know, someone young would be that dumb, one would think. But this brilliant man decided to kill two sins with one act. And it became known, well known, because it was reported commonly. It was talked about. Right? Can you see it? It was talked about, reported commonly, and yet nothing done about it. This is going to be the crux of our message today. Because why have 1 Corinthians 5? Why have it here as instruction to church leadership to do what they need to do if it's not heeded? Now let me give you an example. Go to 1 Samuel chapter 2. And can I say this too? Folks, I lean on grace. If I can, at all possible, lean on the side of grace, I'm gonna. I will look for opportunities to show grace. Do you want to know why? Because I want God to show me grace. It's selfish. I don't want to be a hypocrite and get in trouble with God. Okay, but 
But watch this now. 1 Samuel chapter 2, verses 12 through 17. Now the sons of Eli were sons of Belial. They knew not the Lord. So you had a priest. Eli was the priest of the church, or of the, of the, um, of the congregation there. And he had sons, and they were sons of Belial. They were children of the devil. They knew not the Lord. But they were priests. Let's keep reading. Verse 13. And the priests... Oh, actually, that's pretty indicative today. They know not the Lord and their priests. Stuff just comes to me. What can I say? And the priest's custom with the people was that when any man offered sacrifice, the priest's servant came while the flesh was in seething with a flesh hook of three teeth in his hand. So they'd come up to the pot while the, and they'd come up and the servant at the discretion of the priest would come up and throw in the hook and whatever flesh came out, they would take. Verse 14. He struck it into the pan or kettle or cauldron or pot. All that the flesh hook brought up, the priest took for himself. So they did in Shiloh unto all the Israelites that came thither. So these priests were Eli's sons that were doing this. And they would send their servants to do it. You say, well, what's the big deal? Well, this is a matter of knowing some law here and what's appropriate for priests according to the Old Testament law. And I'm not going to give you all that. And quite honestly, I don't know that we understand. I don't know that I understand all of it. What I can very easily gather is that it was inappropriate for them to do that. Okay, verse 15. Also before they burned the fat, the priest's servant came and said to the man that sacrificed, Give flesh to roast for the priest, for he will not have sodden uh, flesh of thee but raw. He, I don't like what you're giving him. Uh, the priest said, I want it this way instead. Yeah, but God told me to do it this way. Yeah, but the priest said, boy, that's indicative too. Oh, I don't know. Father, the Bible says this. Yeah, but I say, yeah. And if any man said unto him, ready? If any man said unto him, un, unto the servant of the priest, let them not fail to burn the fat presently. No, you've got to do this first, is what they're going. And they're saying, this is inappropriate. And then take as much as thy soul desires. Then he would answer him, nay, but thou shalt give it to me now, and if not, I will take it by force. Father, but the Bible says, I don't care, and if you don't like it, I will excommunicate you. That's different than what we're dealing with with 1 Corinthians 5, by the way. But give it to me now or I'm going to take it from you. Verse 17. Wherefore the sin of the young men was very great before the Lord. And here's why. Is it because they took the flush at this point and they did this with this? And this is where people get caught up. This is where what I call pharisaical saved people get so caught up on the letter they're not understanding the purpose for the letter. I got people who are still trying to convince me that I shouldn't eat shellfish. And people wonder why I get so quickly on them about that. Don't you come to me with that. Because that is a perversion of the grace of God. The whole book of Galatians is written about it. Don't talk to me about this nonsense. Yeah. According to God, according to what is my rule, by my God, in his word, if I give thanksgiving for it, it's mine. Amen. <clears throat> Shellfish and all. Amen. Lobster and all. Amen. Amen. Now, if I have a personal conviction over it, then it's my personal conviction, and as long as I think it's sin, then it's sin unto me, and I shouldn't partake. Yeah. Great. Then have that standard. But here's why. It tells you why this was such a problem. For men abhorred the offering of the Lord. Yeah. So the people were coming into the, let's just call it the church, the assembly, and they were bringing their offering, and the priests were so corrupt that they would come in and do this thing and people just hate it. Oh, I'm going to come to church. I'm going to bring my offering. These people are sick. Why am I here? What am I doing? And they hated it. 
And that's what happens to that world out there. When they see something that isn't even named in their camp, in this camp, they abhor, they abhor the offering of the Lord. What's the offering of the Lord? The Lord Jesus Christ. They will abhor Him if we do something that's viciously vile, disgusting. It ruins His name. This is another local assembly. It's a local assembly for all points and purposes with a common report of men running into the assembly. These aren't pew sitters. These are men um, uh, uh, that are in charge having their servants run in. So again, I mean, this it's on both sides of the pulpit. This isn't about this everyone, everyone. These men were known to do evil. Now, look at 1 Samuel 3 and verse 11. We don't have a lot of time, so I've got to kind of skip through around on this because we've got so much more to do and we're already late. 1 Samuel 3 and verse 11. And the Lord said unto Samuel, Behold, I will do a thing in Israel at which both the ears of everyone that heareth it shall tingle. You know it's bad if your ears are going to tingle. In that day I will perform against Eli. Who was Eli? He was, the high, he, was the high, he was the chief priest who had the sons. I will perform against Eli all things which I have spoken concerning his house. When I begin, I will also make an end. For I have told him that I will judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knoweth. Because his sons made themselves vile, and he restrained them not. Eli, as it appears, just believed in grace. Eventually, Eli's boys were killed by the Lord. And Eli, in the midst they had the whole... Uh, uh, area was taken over uh, by strangers. The ark was taken. I believe it was the Philistines came in. They took the ark. And he gets all this news. His sons are dead. And he's sitting in the gate of the city. And scripture says he was a big chubby man. And he was on that gate. And he fell backwards and broke his neck and died. All while his sons were dead. Judgment against his house. Remember the Lord said, in the, day, in the day I will perform against Eli, which I have spoken concerning his house, when I begin, I will also make an end. It all happened in one day. He said it was. And you read what happened in the fourth chapter. You just read, keep reading, and in the fourth chapter it happened. He says, when, I, when it begins, it's going to end. It's all going to happen very, very quickly. Whole assembly was corrupt. And God could have brought judgment upon the boys alone, but the main guy in charge refused to do anything about their corruption. Therefore, it affected his whole house and the whole assembly and the whole country. By the way, the illustration that I gave you earlier about the man that just believes in grace, he is no longer a pastor. So, the subject matter is difficult. And a pastor's got to be careful not to just start getting so ornery that he's threatening everybody all the time. Because who wants to live under that, right? I mean, as they say, you've got to feed the sheep daily. You don't got to shear them every day. Right? Man, you don't. You don't. So, you give them this... And then feed them every day and hope that they'll remember the last cheering <laughs> and it no longer be an issue. Um, no pastor, no good pastor, wants to have to make this decision. Trust me, he will do everything he can to keep the inevitable from becoming inevitable. He wants to just believe in grace. 
But if he's a pastor that wants to follow the book, he can't just believe in grace. Now, again, I was hoping to do this message in one shot because, well, you, you know, because <laughs> who wants to deal with this two weeks in a row, right? Um, we don't want to dwell on this subject matter, but here we are, and I thought, why not just take our time and really get this because not many churches are teaching it. Uh, I gave you an example, you know, of what churches are doing. And, and church leadership's got to be careful because you're going to have good, well-intentioned saints coming to you with issues of judgment that they think you should enact. And by the word of God, you shouldn't have to, even though they want you to. And in those cases, I think, why do you want me to get the person in trouble? <clears throat> and then flip it around, and when you do something like this, then there's always a few families that go, I can't believe you did that. Well, but I had to. Yeah, but th that's just judgmental. You don't really understand the whole situation. The theme of this whole chapter is not just gross immorality, sin, and rebellion. That's not the theme. That would be citing the problem without considering the solution. The theme, the core of this issue is about purity and unity. That's the theme. Which is interesting because typically in today's church, enacting this means a split. I've heard of it. I've talked to pastors. I've counseled with pastors. We've talked about this chapter. They've had to do it. It has made other families up and leave. But that's not the intent of this. And if our spirit and our heart was right, that wouldn't be what would follow. If this thing is done correctly, the sinner who's involved with the gross sin and the congregation and the leadership that have to enact the discipline can come back together again in the spirit um, of unity if everyone stays humble. It'll take humble repentance on the part of the person who has committed the sin, and it'll take humble, um, uh, a humble congregation willing to forgive the, unrepent or the repentant party. But it can be done, and I have proof. It's called 2 Corinthians. And in that, Paul says, hey, wait a minute. The guy repented. Let's bring this guy back in. This guy. This guy. That guy. <laughs> you know what this is? It sounds silly when I say it, but bear with me. This is an adult timeout. Out you go, go think about what you've done. That's what it is. Now, can I say this? In this day and age that we live in, we're finding it more and more, and I keep talking to pastors about this stuff. The closer we stick to the Bible, the more a church body isn't really appreciative of it. And we're getting to the place of where either certain parties in the church want to live in a particular manner so they leave the church, or others are too holy for the rest of the congregation so they leave the church. Whether it's a person who just is tired of the oppressive nature of the church and its rules or the other person who thinks boy nobody's as holy as I am the solution to leave the church think about this is the solution that God says that's when you punish somebody 
So what I'm doing then when I say I'm too holy for this congregation, I'm going to go have church in my living room. Or when I don't want to be around you people anymore because, you know, I mean, you, you, you think we need to be here every Sunday. So I'm going to leave. Do you realize that you are willingly putting yourself in the place that God says condemn the sinner to? Isn't that strange? That saved people would willingly go out into the devil's world. God said, that's your punishment. That's like a child going, I'm going to time out. Now, I don't know about you, my kids wouldn't do that. Right? Or a spanking. No one's volunteering for punishment except for Laodicean Christians. It's confusion. Well, we have introduced ourselves into this difficult subject matter. We have now poured a foundation with verse 1 and understanding its context. Um, and Lord willing, next week we're going to build upon, I guess, if you will. Commonly reported and willful. That's what this is. That's not the same as a sinner saved by grace. That's not the same, again, as all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. This is, I do what I want to do despite what the Word of God says and I demand that you be accepting of it. And because churches have indeed been accepting of it, churches have ceased from being pure light in the community. Churches have become a sanctuary for those who no longer believe in God's holiness. It's true. Because if you don't like our standard here, you can go somewhere down the street. You can commit a gross act of sin and go down the street and find a home in a church. That's why they've become a safe harbor for sin. Because pastors are so afraid. They're so afraid people are going to get angry. But look what happened to Eli. Let the people get angry. I say, if you are an all-grace person and I enact judgment and I anger you, be angry. If you are an all-judgment person and I enact grace and you want to get angry at me, be angry. It is my responsibility and the responsibility of the leadership of this church, and I'm speaking to all of our leadership now, it is our responsibility to balance grace and truth and to not let the assembly make that decision of which it should be, but this. It's not all grace, but it's not no grace. You've got to strike a balance. God's word is perfectly balanced, so let's follow it. Okay, want to go home? I know you do. I want to. Father, uh, uh, tough, Lord, and long, I know. So, uh, Lord, I thank you that uh, the people have been very patient. Um, and I pray that you'd bless them for it, Lord God, and for sitting through a message like this, because it's not fun. Um, so I pray, Lord, that um, you would double bless them for having sat and listened. And, and Lord, may they contemplate it. May I contemplate um, everything that we looked at, and including... Uh, be prayerfully ready to receive um, what's coming both Wednesday and um, Sunday to follow. And Lord, thank you for loving us. Thank you for being so merciful in so many different ways, Lord. Thank you for giving us of your son who died in 
our place for our sins. Lord God, just we don't deserve any of it. We are, in comparison to you, vile. Um, and yet, as the scripture said, you've commended your love towards us and that while we were yet sinners, you died for us. And I thank you for that. I thank you for your grace. And I also thank you for your truth. And I pray that we would learn how to balance that perfectly in our hearts, in our homes, and in this assembly. For we ask it in your name. Amen.